you know, I think in space flight, nothing is normal. There's no such thing as normal. And so we've all got a very nonlinear journey by the time we're actually launching on a spacecraft. Taken in a vacuum, that thought from NASA astronaut Zena Cardman could apply to a lot of different astronauts. The path for each of the members of SpaceX's Crew-11 mission to the International Space Station was especially nonlinear. Cardman was originally slated to command the Crew-9 mission to the ISS. This was set to be her first mission to space. Separation confirmed. Starliner is now backing away from station and starting its return to Earth. However, issues that arose during the crew flight test of Boeing's CST-100 Starliner spacecraft caused NASA to bring that capsule home without its crew. When they made that decision back in August of 2024, NASA leadership decided that astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore would return to Earth on board the Dragon Freedom, slated to fly the Crew-9 mission. But for that to happen, two seats had to be empty on the way uphill, meaning Cardman and her former crewmate, Stephanie Wilson, were suddenly grounded. When that decision was made, you know, when it was announced, you had a, a really beautiful tweet that you posted and that you described it as both a heartbreak and an honor to, to hand over the reins. Um, you know, in, in crafting that and sort of thinking about what that transition, that baton handing meant to you in that moment, what was going through your mind and your heart in that whole, you know, affair? There are so many different things that go into a moment like that. It's a real gamut of emotion at that point. We had all trained together as a crew for almost 18 months at that point, and we were friends. We're basically family by the time you get to that stage where you're ready to quarantine for a launch. And a lot of the feeling of loss from those changes that happened to Crew 9 was just losing this opportunity for us to fly together. It's less about any specific individual and more about the big picture. But of course, that's what helps us still feel really invested part of the mission. Even though we are staying on the ground, there are so many people who are invested in part of a mission who don't actually launch in the capsule with the crew. I was just so grateful that Stephanie and I could be a part of the training that Nick and Alex did to step into those roles. Three, two, one. Ignition, ignition, full power, and liftoff of Crew 9. Go SpaceX, go Falcon, go NASA. So grateful that we could both be there for the launch, and then I can't imagine not being at Ellington Field for their return. Thank you for your clothes. <laughs> Thank you for your coffee. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Cardman says she didn't have to wait long, though, after NASA made the shuffle on the Crew 9 lineup before she was assigned as the commander of Crew 11. I had actually just come from our very first trip to Hawthorne as Crew 11 the day before I flew out to the Crew 9 launch to do the broadcast with them. And so it was a wild, very surreal experience going through that journey, but I was so grateful that I had this to look forward to. And I've gotten to learn a lot about myself as an astronaut, as a teammate, as a leader, based on my Crew-9 experience that I now have the benefit and gift of bringing to Crew-11. Becoming an astronaut wasn't always in the cards for Cardman. She told us about her path to the astronaut corps in July 2024, back when she was still the commander of Crew-9. I loved science growing up. I also loved writing and art. Um, it wasn't until maybe halfway through college. Uh, as a science major, I had the great fortune of doing a lot of field work in remote locations, places like Antarctica or offshore on research vessels. I grew to love the operational side of that research and the teamwork aspect uh, as much as the research itself. And so now the chance to be the hands and lab notebook for research projects on the International Space Station is so exciting, such a privilege for me. And the notion that I may someday get to do geoscience on the surface of the moon is just hard to wrap your head around, but it's really thrilling to be at NASA as we are developing the concept of operations, all of the suits, all of the technology uh, for those missions. Cardman earned both a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in marine sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She was a PhD candidate in geosciences. All right, let's give it up for Zena Cardman. When she was selected as a member of NASA's 2017 astronaut class, known as the Turtles. She's the last American member of that group to fly to space. 
I think the real legacy of the turtles is one that we are seeing throughout the office, but it is, um, it's cultural as much as it is technical. These are people who are incredibly easy to get along with. We really help each other out. We all have different strengths, different weaknesses, and I think they have set an example for me that I'm hoping to carry forward in my mission and then as I get to work with younger classes in the future. When you're in a spacesuit, it's really important to remember, uh, number one, you don't want to hit your own visor, but number two, it's actually really hard to get a good big swing with your arm. And so a trick that I learned from Trevor is that using chisels is really helpful. So we'll actually be using the chisel and then hammering the chisel itself. As a geologist, Cardman has also been deeply involved with the plans for moon surface operations as part of the Artemis program. Last year, she was able to travel to SpaceX's Starbase facilities to watch a Starship launch in person. A future version of that rocket's upper stage will bring astronauts to the surface of the moon beginning on the Artemis 3 mission. I was most closely involved with what's going to happen actually after we set foot outside of the lander on the surface, so especially related to moonwalks, how we're going to integrate a remote science team and a remote mission control uh, with people who are not necessarily the scientific experts on the surface, and that has included the concept of operations for spacewalking. It's also included development of the new suits. But in doing so, I was really lucky that I got to interface with a lot of people who are involved in HLS and getting that cabin and displays ready. We've participated in a few uh, evaluations of displays. I think it's very important to get humans in the loop as early as possible uh, when we have a chance to iterate on design. Cardman's space odyssey of flowing from one crewed mission to another is something that she shares with her three crewmates. None of them were originally assigned to Crew 11, and the others were originally training to fly on different spacecraft as well before being reassigned. For us, because we were so well trained on ISS systems and ISS procedures, really we just had to focus on bonding as a team and bringing the three people who hadn't seen a Dragon spacecraft before up to speed on the Dragon, but that left us a lot of bandwidth to have a really good time and just get to bond together as a crew. Even with so much changing between her role in Crew 9 versus her role in Crew 11, Carbon says some of the science she's involved with on orbit actually gets to stay the same. One experiment that's actually coming with me from Crew 9 to Crew 11 is called Cypher, which is a very comprehensive biomedical study of what happens to the human body before, during, after spaceflight. Uh, and that's because I'm the test subject, and so of course I'm coming with the experiment. I'm really excited that I get to still do that. Um, but I actually love that every day on ISS is going to be different, and we train to be ready for anything. I love that about our job. At the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Will Robinson-Smith, Spaceflight Now.